I was looking at uh, Ted Barris's book, Rush to Danger, and was interested in it for a couple of reasons. One is, it's in great part about his father, the great broadcaster, Alex Barris, whom I knew briefly at the CBC, but also I thought my dad would really like it because he, as you can see, was in WW2 as a merchant mariner. And then I realized, well, my dad's gone. And so are most of the people who were in the World War, uh, the Second World War. And I thought, well, then it's up to you and me, Ted, to just tell these stories because the people who love your books and the people who are in your books and the people who were in the war are no longer here. So it's got to be the kids who, uh, who allow the stories to live on. Uh, kind of an interesting wake up call for me this Remembrance Day, I must say. Anyway, welcome back. Thank you. And, and, uh, and, a, and a very uh, thoughtful entry to our talk today, because, um, you know, we, we, you and I didn't live through the war. We were born right at the end of it or into the, the baby boom years. I'm um, much younger than you are, Ted. Sorry to okay. just um, get the I, record I, straight. Okay, I, I, my mistake. Um, and, and, and what's important is that we had some of the stories told to us uh, on rare occasions when dad would, you know, make a reference to uh, a memory or a person or remind us a little bit about some of the hardship that people coming out of the 1930s, like your dad and, and, and my folks uh, did, um, and recognize that they got the double whammy. They got the depression and then they got the second world war. And if they survive both, what a miracle, what a gift, and what a chance to take those memories and preserve them so that we don't forget that extraordinary survivability. Well, and you've done a great job and let's stick with your dad for a while. Sure. Uh, for those who may not know, Front Page Challenge was one of the great uh, television programs in Canadian history, uh, Pierre Burton, Betty Kennedy, Gordon Sinclair. And then later it was called Old Age Challenge with uh, Jock Webster, whom I worked with as well. And your dad was one of the original panelists and the writer on it and just had a smile about this big and a pleasant look on his face when I ended up working with him very briefly. But he was also in the Battle of the Bulge and uh, was not slapped by Patton, but was given a stern lecture by Patton. Can you start with that story? Well, um, a little bit of context. While most of the people who are uh, watching and listening today may know my father's name, Alex Barris, they will know him as a Canadian. Um, in fact, he was born in New York City. So he was an American citizen, born in 1922. And when America came into the war after Pearl Harbor in 1941, uh, by the time that my dad reached his 20th birthday in September of 1942, his country called him up. And um, interestingly, he filled out all the draft papers that you're supposed to because everybody had to serve in one way or another. And he sent them off. He's in New York City. And uh, nothing happened. And he waited and waited and waited. So finally, he just, you know, honest Al, <laughs> he goes down to the draft office to say, so what gives? And you know how sometimes you and I still have filing cabinets with file folders, right? You know how when you sometimes jam it so full that when you pull out the drawer sometime, a file gets pulled up and tucked on the top of the files and, and lost there? That's what had happened to his file. His sister, Irene, was so pissed off at him. Why did you go there? You could have avoided the war completely. They lost you. Dad said, no, but it's my obligation. So when he is there, um, he said, what do you need? And they said, we need medics. And he said, fine. Now, my dad had that much medical skill and training but they sent him off to Kansas to become a medic. And so ultimately, and we'll talk some other details, he ends up in the Battle of the Bulge um, in the, at the end of 1944, uh, the early winter of 1944-45, and it turns out to be the bloodiest campaign the Americans engaged in in the entire Second World War, 90,000 casualties between January the 1st and about April the 1st, 1945, when my dad was in the middle of it. Yeah. Uh, and the circumstance under which he gets a bawling out, albeit in a, in a big crowd, uh, 
a bowling out by George S. Patton. Well, my dad, while he respected authority, did not respect General Patton because um, he made decisions and treated people unlike anyone that my father would call a friend. Um, he was, in, in Patton was um, a great leader, uh, but an SOB. And my dad learned this on an occasion as he is entering this horrific Battle of the Bulge. Let me pick up a little bit more of his story and get you there. So my dad lands in France three months exactly to the day after D-Day in September, September the 6th, 1944. And in fact, he goes through some of the wreckage that's on the beach left over from the landings on D-Day. But he's assigned to Western France. His unit is the 94th Infantry Division. His is a medical battalion, the 319th, again, in the U.S. Army. And they go to Western France to hem in two German armies, which are protecting the U-boat pens at Saint-Nazaire and Lorient, France. And he could have spent the war there doing nothing. But suddenly the Germans break out in the Ardennes in the Battle of the Bulge and dad's division is transferred from Western France suddenly to the middle of this horrific battle. And they go there ill-prepared, not just he personally, because he learned as a medic, first aid and anatomy. Well, first aid and anatomy do not a medic make. You've got to be able to work on your feet, be able to deal with the horrific nature of wounds, which my dad learned in the Battle of the Bulge. But before all that ramps up, it becomes clear to Patton that the 94th Infantry Division thrown into the middle of this battle in January 1945 is not very well prepared. And so he blames them. And so my dad and a bunch of other officers, my dad was a sergeant, so he was a, an NCO. They're all rounded up and they're brought back behind the lines to a little place in France that was sort of like an artificial or no, a natural amphitheater. And this was in January, 1945, cold as, as ever. And they're thrown into this hollow and they don't know why, but they're gonna be visited by somebody who's up there, somebody in the brass. And of course, who rolls in on his Jeep with the pistols and the, you know, the brandishing arms and, and, um, and hand grenades, but Patton himself roars in, they set up a stage, plunk down a microphone and he, essentially tears a strip off the 94th for having the most non-combat casualties because they're freezing to death. They haven't got the right boots and, and clothing. They're not given air support and tank support or artillery support. They're essentially pushing the Germans who have now moved across the Ardennes and into Belgium back into Germany by brute force, which causes great casualties. So Germany is is in this stalemate with the Americans and the British and the Canadians there, but my, my dad is in the American sector and Patton doesn't like what they're doing. So he tears a strip off them for an hour, literally stands on this stage and calls them the lowest of the low, you know, denigrating the flag and all of that stuff. Does this sound familiar? Anyway, um, then, uh, you know, gets back in his Jeep and tears, he, he almost fires the uh, general commanding the 94th Infantry Division. So they go back and essentially say, okay, well, what's gonna change so that we can do the job? Ultimately, they begin to realize that you gotta supply these guys with the right, not just armament, but behind the lines for the medics, all of the facilities to save the wounded, treat them properly, keep them warm and fed and move them back. So in this process, my dad is at the very front line. He's what's called a runner going between the battle line and his platoon, if you like, of medics and stretcher bearers are operating as they push the Germans back from Belgium into Germany across the border in horrific winter conditions, the coldest winter of the war. And he ends up at a place called Camp Holtz Woods in February of 1945. Would you like me to go on? Yes, please. At that point, just across the border into Germany, any opposing force, whether they be allied or otherwise, are gonna find the Germans well prepared to throw them back with everything, booby traps, mines, crossfire, enfilade, uh, bombardment, hidden weaponry. And that's exactly what they find the Americans walk into in a place called Camp Holtz Woods. And when I was doing my research, among the places I visited was the University of Georgia, Athens campus, where the 94th Infantry Division records and the 319th Medical Battalion records are held. And I learned among other things, 
that my dad and his unit on a day in February, 1945, between nine in the morning and nine in the evening, 12 hours, they dealt with something like 120 severe casualties in that 12 hour period. So they're dealing with a wounded man. And we're not talking about bumps and bruises. We're talking about lacerations and lost limbs and horrific head wounds, all in the space of 12 hours, 120 of them. And then I realized what my father was up against. Mm. Anyway, in the middle of this, my dad, as I discover later, was had sent four stretcher bearers and medics into Camp Holtz Woods to retrieve wounded. And suddenly in this horrific experience of handling all these casualties, he realizes those four guys haven't come back. He's a sergeant. He's their supervisor. He's got to go back and find out what the hell happened. He goes through essentially a minefield, which the uh, other elements of the division had walked through in the earlier part of, the, of that battle. He finds footsteps that haven't exploded in the middle of the night, goes into the woods and brings out those four guys, two of whom are wounded, two are disoriented, and I learn all this because a friend of my dad's in that situation, we'll talk about him later, told me that he had the records of my dad's achievement as acknowledged on a citation which gave my father the award of the Bronze Star. And, and I had hence, no idea. And hence the title, Rush to Danger. Absolutely. And my father was in the middle of it. And that's, that's why... Um, uh, that, that was the impetus, that not, not that that courageous act uh, was, was something I knew. I had to find it out. I had to f discover it. But because I sensed that my father had faced something that was more horrific than just a medical badge and a U.S. Army badge on his uniform. Ted, lots of uh, real and horrific death and destruction in your books, all of your books. But let's uh, lighten the load a little wee bit and talk about not the near-death experience of both of our fathers, and I'll swap stories with you as we would if we were having a pint somewhere, but uh, talk about your dad's real death experience at his high school after the war. Oh, wow. Um, well, dad was the only member of his family coming through the Depression who actually graduated from high school. Uh, he had an older brother, Angelo, and an older sister, Irene. He had a younger sister, Helen, who died of pneumonia in the 1930s. Um, but dad was the only one who actually finished high school uh, at a modern uh, high school in downtown New York City, Manhattan. Uh, the name of it has just slipped my memory. But it was... Well, it was I, I recall it was, uh, and I thought this odd, called the Harlem High School, but it was uh, down around 60th... Uh, Columbus Circle. I don't know why it would have been named that way, but so be it. Anyway, um, it's quite well known as a school that uh, graduated some fairly celebrated uh, motion picture actors and, and directors, uh, diplomats, um, uh, other war heroes. Um, but my dad was just a, an average kid who went through diligently because he loved education. He loved, he, he would love to have gone on to university but there wasn't the money. So he finished high school. And then about that time, the war for the Americans begins. And then he goes into this channel. He ends up overseas in the Battle of the Bulge. Anyway, he comes back safely. Um, and let me tell you how he got back before I tell you about the high school. So dad gets through the war virtually without a physical scratch. I mean, he had, you know, no doubt some horrific memories of the night I just described to you. But he gets to Marseille after doing a stint of occupation in Czechoslovakia, where they were involved in restoring infrastructure to parts of Czechoslovakia at the end of the war. He gets to Marseille and he's waiting for a Liberty ship to bring him home. It's December, 1945. So now he, his number is up. They throw them all into this big uh, transport truck, bring them down to the docks at Marseille, open the tailgate, dad falls out of the truck, <laughs> tripping over the tailgate, he cracks his arm and scratches his head. So he's got a sling and a bandage and he gets on the Liberty ship, does the two week crossing of the Liberty ship to New York City, arrives in New York City. It's December the around the 15th. And guess who the first off the ship are? The wounded. <laughs> so my dad with his cracked arm and the bent. Now, clearly it didn't affect his crap shooting hand because he won a lot of money on in craps on the way back on the Liberty ship. Anyway, he gets off the boat. And as all of the vets at that point 
uh, are hankering to do, enough already with the war. We're done. We did our service. I survived. I want to get married. I want to find work. I want to get my life back. So to get his records, he goes back to the high school, waits his turn for an interview with the record administrator at the high school. And as he's waiting for her to deliver them to him, he wanders down the hall. And all of a sudden he comes across, this is, you know, some months after the end of the war, he comes across an honor roll. Many high schools, even today, will acknowledge those who served and those who died in their honor roll back in high school. Guess what? He sees his name on the honor roll as someone who was sacrificed <laughs> during the war. Now, it's a thundering moment to realize that the school thinks he's dead and there he is in the flesh. And when he points this out to the woman who returns the records to him, she's affronted. How could we make such a mistake? He said, I don't know, but that's wrong. Anyway, she goes off in a huff, gives him his records and he leaves. But imagine all of the service he did and he's considered dead at the end of it. Well, number one, being a future journalist, uh, even if he's reported as dead, he checks it out. Uh, which is good. And secondly, my recollection from your book is that the school administrator said, now, I don't know what's the matter with some of you boys, but you've had a horrible time overseas. Now, just be on your way. She didn't want to hear the explanation that he was alive. Well, the quick story with my dad, who's behind me there, uh, he too left school uh, age 17, uh, grade 10, joined the Merchant Marine, was on essentially a floating bomb. Uh, he was an SO mariner on a tanker ferrying aviation gas to Newfoundland and Halifax. And uh, he was reported missing. He wasn't uh, in a great deal of danger, although there were submarines and there were submarine battles on the East Coast, as you know, a lot of shipping sunk. That's but my they, next book. Yeah, they hid out in a cove uh, in Newfoundland for a couple of days, but being reported missing, his family uh, dealt with that uh, news in the following way, they broke into his sea chest and drank all his rum. And when he got back, he thought, you know, couldn't they have at least waited another couple of days? Um, and he had a great coat. I know you talk about trying on your dad's military uniform. My dad was six foot two and I'm just under six feet uh, and wearing his bridge coat, uh, which was like a Navy bridge coat that came an extra two inches uh, lower on my legs was quite uh, uh, quite the thrill in, in Montreal winters. Let Ted, me tell you about that jacket. Mm. Um, these were um, most of the military uniforms that the American servicemen received. You got your, you know, your battle dress, and then you also got sort of dress uniforms. And among the dress uniform units was what was called an Eisenhower jacket. Now an Eisenhower jacket was very trimly um, cut and it sort of sharpened and showed off your physique quite literally um, and tight to the waist. And that's where the, the jacket ended. And I thought when I saw it in my dad's wardrobe after the war, wow, is that ever cool? Does he ever look you know, nifty in that jacket? I don't know why he kept it, at least I didn't at that point. And then I tried it on when he wasn't there just to see how it fit. And I later learned that the reason he'd kept it was not because it made him look spiffy and physique wonderful, but because they were so poorly equipped, it was another layer of coat to keep him from freezing to death in the Battle of the Bulge. Yeah. Ted, your book though, uh, is not just about your father, and I note you admitted, omitted my father and you are forgiven, but anyway, Rush to Danger talks about medics going all the way back to Florence Nightingale, uh, in Vietnam. I mean, it's just a tour de force on the role of medics in battle. Uh, I've always been fascinated by an old book called uh, The Century of the Surgeon, which documents how the 19th century was the century of dirty hands, where physicians would go right from uh, autopsies to delivering babies, and they killed their patients in great numbers. You document uh, a portion of uh, the real resistance, and I'm glad you called it that, by the way, um, where someone was really scrubbing down the whole um, area where medics were working and uh, putting wounded uh, soldiers on a barge in Saskatoon and getting that 
barge all the way to Winnipeg, which was much quicker than by uh, roadway. Well, I didn't know of someone so interested in the germ theory in those days, and I didn't know you could get there uh, uh, via waterways, which kind of is a lead into the plug of your other old book, and that is Fire Canoe. Um, tell that story, if, if you would, and, and how advances in blood transfusions and sanitation and all this sort of stuff happened in theaters of war. Well, you're referring in the, uh, the resistance uh, period in, in 1885 to the final days of the Riel resistance um, in, in the spring of 1885. By this time, the Canadian uh, militia mounted by General George Middleton has arrived in the West and has essentially assembled its forces uh, where the train tracks ended in, in Winnipeg and moved west to pick up routes north to the battle areas around Cutknife and Battleford and so on uh, in central Saskatchewan, what, would, what was then uh, the, the territories, but uh, Saskatchewan territory, later the province. And um, what was remarkable was they understood what they were up against, that not unlike other wars, um, the Boer War in the 1880s, 90s, uh, and the Great War in the, in the first years of the 20th century, that their enemy wasn't so much the wounds themselves, but the sanitation. And the man who's given the job of directing the uh, medical treatment of the wounded during the uh, final days of the resistance, when essentially Riel was defeated and Gabriel de Mont defeated at, at Batage, was to send Thomas Roddick, who was a well-known McGill graduate who had um, taken up quite seriously, not just the value of learning surgery, learning the capabilities that surgery offered to stitch people back together to do incredible pieces of, 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 of life saving, but also the value of sanitation. The great enemy of any surgeon pre-1900 was not so much the wound, but the infection. And as often is the case, battles don't happen in clean places. And in many cases, it, they're, they are waged in, in farm fields, which are laden with manure and all of the worst things that you can imagine to infect a wound. So all the great surgeries that were done in the resistance period in 1885 out west, um, in the, the Boer War, uh, in the Crimean War, all the way through the Great War, the great surgery, the enemy wasn't so much the wound, but the infection. And Roddick is one of the first to use a sanitation notion where they would take this chemical and spray it to keep things um, relatively clean. And the idea of sanitizing utensils rather than just reusing them to cut off limbs and the rest of it, as you alluded to earlier, but to use clean instrumentation to make sure that as much as possible, we don't infect a wound that may already be that way anyway. And then the latter part of what you talked about was a remarkable uh, discovery at the very end of the battle they needed to get the wounded from Batoche back to the railhead in Winnipeg. That's like 200, 300 miles away. So they realized right there was a presentation of another means of getting men from the battlefield back to Fort Garry or Winnipeg, and it was by the river. And so the, my other book that you alluded to, um, Fire Canoe, uh, describes uh, in, in detail what it was like to establish a network of steamboat travel across the prairies uh, pre-1900. So, which, which I wish we still had, having yeah. taken the train across Canada many, many times. Yeah. Um, and, uh, oh, I guess my record is uh, eight days late uh, going across the country. It's a glorious trip, but I wish yeah. we had the steamboats. So the steamboats, which had actually been used in the Battle of Batoche, one of them, the SS Northcote, becomes the sort of central uh, passenger vessel, the hospital vessel, if you like, with a bunch of barges around it to go from Saskatoon on the south branch of the Saskatchewan River to the main branch, all the way north to the top end of Lake Winnipeg, which is occupying most of Manitoba, across the rapids at the top of the lake, down the lake to uh, Selkirk, overland to Winnipeg, into hospital, and there by rail east. So this uh, quickens the, the, the passage and makes the passage much gentler on the wounded men. And because they had these barges, they had a supply of food. They even had cattle 
from which they could get milk to help keep the nourishment uh, uh, strong and, and healthy for the recovering wounded. Ted, uh, I believe it's this book, although you have so many books, I might uh, get one confused with the other, but I'm pretty sure it's in this book. You talk about the invention of the gas mask. And that is a great story with a great Canadian connection. And that is your lead in. You're on, Ted. It's a fabulous story. I mean, every time I tell this story, I think I should write a movie script because you you could not come up with this <laughs> in your imagination. It is the most bizarre story. Um, I'll try to keep it um, tight. Um, when the Great War breaks out, many of the civilian doctors who have served in Canada in a number of capacities in hospitals, in their own practices, step up as medical officers in the Canadian Army uh, or the, the Canadian Medical Corps. Among them is a Newfoundlander. He wasn't a Canadian at the time, of course. Newfoundland at the time of the Great War was a separate dominion. But as a Newfoundlander, he joins the Royal Newfoundland Regiment as a medical officer, Clooney McPherson. And off he goes, and he arrives in Europe in 1915, and he's actually at the Ypres salient, which was the bulge in the Western Front that the Allies protected from German occupation throughout the Great War. And it's at the point uh, when the Germans unleash the very first chlorine gas attack. And he's behind the lines. He can see, as he and a number of colleagues, see this horrible green monster coming at them. And ironically, um, there was a, a way of protecting yourself some of the officers in that battle realized that chlorine gas, they had no gas masks at the time, chlorine gas had an antidote. And so some of the officers in that horrific moment in April of 1915 screamed to their men, take out your handkerchief, pee into it, put it over your nose and mouth to keep the air from going in or the gas from going in and the ammonia in the hanky will crystallize the chlorine and save you. Some manage to do that, others don't. The, the, the horrific damage to the men uh, who essentially puke out their lungs and die from these horrific burns from the, the chlorine gas um, are among the patients that Clooney McPherson faces. He steps up to offer his help to try to find a way of fending off the chlorine gas. Now, back in Newfoundland as a civilian doctor, he suddenly remembers he'd come up with an interesting hood that he had used for his patients when transporting them through cold weather, the hood being a protection from the cold. But he realizes that the contents of that hood, which are a combination of cloth and cotton, uh, wool and cotton, was something called viella. And he wonders whether that might be impervious to the gas. So he, he has a little uh, laboratory behind the lines uh, in France and a major offers to be the guinea pig for his prototype. So they put this hood over his head and they have a little gas chamber and they shove this major in it with the gas mask, Clooney McPherson's prototype, and they start firing this gas into the chamber. Well, after about a minute, the major isn't aware that the gas has been uh, sent in and he opens his hood to scream at them, when are you gonna pump the gas in? They realize that he's now exposed to the gas. They open the door, pull him out, save him and realize that the Viella hood worked. So now Clooney McPherson goes back to England and begins the assembly line process of building these Viella cloth masks or, or uh, hoods, uh, gas masks in effect. So he uses the Viella cloth and, and some, um, uh, plastic, which has been, uh, it's essentially glass for a visor to put across the, in the, insert in the hood for the, for the soldier to see. The problem as they begin to build these things is that glass breaks and completely undermines any protection that the hood would offer. So then he goes to, uh, by, by accident, this is all in a period of weeks after the, the April gas attack. He's, he goes to a lecture by a guy named Batterby in London. And Batterby is lecturing about something uh, called anti-flammable film. Now, why is it important? Well, as you perhaps know from your history, that motion picture film in the early days was quite flammable and projectors used live flames to project the image on the screen. In fact, many of the theaters burned down because the film caught fire. This film was anti-flammable. It did not burn. Suddenly, McPherson realizes it's flexible, it's transparent, and it doesn't burn. It's my new visor. 
Where is this stuff? It's, it's being produced in France at a place called Pathé. <laughs> so he goes back to France. He actually convinces the French to give up some of the, um, uh, this chemical, these, this visor, this sort of plastic, and he gets boxes of it, about 10 boxes, and he throws them in touring cars and races back to the coast to try to get back to England on a ne the next ship. Well, on the way, the cars break down because the boxes are so heavy. He manages to convince a quartermaster in the middle of the French countryside to give him a truck to go back and retrieve the boxes to get to the coast, to get back to England, continue the process. And finally, he goes, he goes before the head of the Royal uh, the Brit Royal British Army Medical Corps, to whom he has to answer for the manufacturing of all these masks. And um, he says to him, the, 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 the chief of the, of the medical staff says, how are you making out? <laughs> and of course, McPherson says, it's been a little difficult to put it mildly. He said, well, have you got enough to build a million masks? And McPherson says, well, actually, sir, I was so concerned about the need of these and recognize that I better move on it that I decided to make 2 million. And of course the boss says, how dare you do that without my permission? <laughs> he said, well, McPherson says, I thought it was in the public interest. And then he looks down at me, he says, how come you didn't make 5 million? In fact, he made 22 million anti-gas masks right in those months leading up to the next battle when the gas was used. And by that time, the Allied troops had Clooney McPherson's prototype gas mask to protect them. And nobody knows that story in Canada at all. You're right, and it should be a movie and get on with that because uh, you've only written 18 books. You must have time on your hands and, uh, and a typewriter and you go to it. Now, you rightly documented your dad's work with about 100 severely injured soldiers in the course of a day. And in all wars, there have been those kinds of horrible statistics. And um, with 100 people going through your surgery or your, uh, you know, your tent, uh, hard to remember them all, but you document a reunion between a medic and his patient in Tampa, Florida. Do you remember that story? Oh, yes. Yes, of course. Um, one of my travels across the country interviewing military medics took me to Winnipeg. And there I met a man named M Norm Mullaney. And while there um, and meeting him, he, was, he and I are both members of the uh, Canadian Aviation Historical Society. And at the local, uh, or it was a national meeting, I guess, a few years ago, Norm and I got talking and turned out he was a little few years older than I am. And I uh, asked him about his military career. He said, well, I actually fought in Vietnam. And I said, a Canadian who served in Vietnam? He said, yeah. So we Five, said- 5,000 did. Yeah, more, more than that. More like 20,000, really? I understand. Anyway, so Norm begins to tell me his story. Um, growing up in, in Winnipeg, his dad is actually a, a construction worker working up on the dew line in Northern Canada in the 1950s, uh, dies prematurely. And so uh, Norm is, is essentially uh, thrown to uh, you know, fend for himself. He wants to become um, a radio technologist, become an electronics expert. He explores TV maintenance and somebody tells him there's not a whole lot of future in that. So he goes to the States in the early 1960s, joins the Air Force in hopes that they'll allow him to learn tectronics and all of the electronics of, of electronics and radiology, radiology and so on. Anyway, um, they tell him because you're an alien, you're a Canadian, not an American, you can't, you're not allowed to do that stuff. We can't train you in electronics. However, we do need medics. And off he goes to Vietnam. And he serves in Vietnam during that horrible period uh, during the Tet Offensive in 1967-68. And uh, he's working at one of the busiest uh, locations on, in South uh, Vietnam, where they were dealing with thousands and thousands of wounded American soldiers every week. Um, and he's a lowly uh, orderly and medic on the, the food chain and deals with some of the most horrific uh, wounds that one could imagine. And in the course of his meeting the many patients that he cleaned and uh, medicated and assisted in surgery with assisted doctors and nurses in surgery was a young guy who had been shot, but he hadn't been shot in combat. It turns out he'd actually gone into a bar in Saigon 
and somebody had come into the bar and started shooting and this guy was wounded in that attack. He ended up at Norm's hospital and he remembers tending this guy so much so that uh, he was at his bedside and the man's heartbeat, the vibration on the cot transposed or was translated to Norm's hands as he rested his hands on the cot. He could feel this guy's heartbeat racing as he was fighting, trying to survive. Anyway, um, he manages to get from him a little bit of information about where he was from and off he goes. Ultimately, one day he's, he's cured enough or um, restored enough that he goes off and uh, eventually he's discharged honorably, the guy who was wounded. And so as Norm gets out of Vietnam, goes back to some of the hospitals that he was uh, training in and he happens to be in Tampa, Florida at a military hospital and a guy comes in and he's actually been getting some psychiatric treatment, post-traumatic stress, I think it was. And suddenly their stories cross and Norm realizes that the guy who's in front of him, who's about to go back into civilian life is the same guy whose heartbeat he felt on the cot several years before in Vietnam. What a coincidence. And to realize for Norm, here was a man he'd assisted back to life, back to civilian life, and he was successful in doing so. And they met by coincidence in Tampa those years later. Ted, uh, the lightning round here um, of, of characters who appear in, in your book, The Great Imposter. Oh, <laughs> well, this is a guy named Sear. Um, who was a doctor on HMCS Cayuga. And Cayuga served not just in the Second World War, but in Korea uh, as part of the blockade. And every ship in the Royal Canadian Navy had surgeons on board. And, and suddenly in the middle of the war, uh, the surgeon on board Cayuga, a man named Sear, was called upon to uh, save the life of a South Korean Marine. And they lay him out on the captain's table. And this guy takes a bullet. Sear takes a bullet from this Marine's chest next to his heart, surgically removes it. And the man lives. Well, somebody on board Cayuga thinks this is a great story. Some PR officer, and he writes up the story and sends it back to Canada. And of course, it gets cleared by the censors. And it's put across the line on CP and broadcast and printed in papers. And then the real Dr. Sear in upstate Maine, I think at the time, calls in and says, you've got an imposter. That guy's not Sear. I'm Sear. I've never been in the Canadian Army. And what is revealed in the story is that the guy who assumed the name of Sear was indeed an imposter, an American who stole Sear's papers, convinced the Canadian Navy to sign him up. He goes off to Korea and manages to save this guy. And clearly uh, what is revealed in the story is that Sear, the imposter, had no medical credentials whatsoever, but still managed to pus pull off such a magical uh, medical moment. And of course, a great movie starring uh, uh, Tony Curtis, Curtis, who is seen holding up a medical textbook while he's operating on somebody learning how to do it. <laughs> did you ever encounter Bryce Eckstein, the great broadcaster in Regina? Whom I, I did, by, certainly on one occasion. Uh, but what's his story? Well, he was told that Al Bonner is going to join the morning show, and he thought it was either the Al Bonner who owned a Texaco station in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, or the Al Bonner who would have been about 60 years old, who uh, was with Bryce in uh, the Canadian Navy. But no, I show up and I'm uh, fresh faced and uh, 22 and <laughs> thankful for the position because I'm otherwise starving to death. And Bryce and I got along well, and he told me the story of being uh, drafted by the Brooklyn Dodgers uh, farm team and being in the Canadian Navy and um, having, uh, let's say, an, an emotional uh, a difficulty dealing with the success and, and the Navy at a young age. And he said he was uh, counseled by the guy who turned out to be the great imposter. <laughs> and so I said, well, Bryce, um, you know, have you ever thought that maybe it didn't actually work and that you're, you know, you're still having these difficulties? Uh, and he said, yeah, that's a possibility. Very good natured about it. And he's, he's now gone, but he was a great guy. 
Um, then I said, gee, I'd like to interview you about your encounter with the great imposter. And he said, you know, I'm not sure I want the world to know that I had these emotional challenges and had to go uh, seek some help. And that was a long, long time ago. Anyway, back to your book, which has, you know, just a, a story every, every couple of pages that is uh, really worth preserving. You talk very frankly about PTSD even the suicide of a veteran, even atrocities by allied soldiers in the field of battle. And I think that that is traumatic, but I think it's an important contribution about our understanding the nature of war. Uh, speak to those issues, if you would. Well, we've only really become aware of post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, PTSD, since in the latter stages of the Second World War. I mean, there were um, facilities where men who were uh, essentially uh, categorized as uh, low um, uh, moral fiber. In other words, I think it was LMF. And you, and you didn't have the courage to stand up to the kind of abuse that went on daily in combat. Um, th that was about as close as we came to understanding that some people just couldn't handle war. Um, but what becomes clear, and I, and I try to explore it as often as I can in my uh, narrative and in some of the stories, is the extraordinary damage that men and women, because I, I tell a lot of great nurse stories as well, uh, and ambulance drivers and so on, women, um, the damage that was done to them as a result of the horrific nature of wounds, uh, dealing with them in such stressful situations, um, uh, dealing with uh, the loss of so many of their patients, not just as we've described in the Great War to um, horrific uh, infection, but also in the battlefield. There are two medics whose stories or medical officers whose stories I tell at the uh, Battle of Dieppe in 1942, uh, two, two Canadians uh, one of whom got away at that at the end of that battle, and the other one was captured, uh, and and how they managed, in spite of the horrific nature of of that beach battle, to save lives, um, and, and and they are among the the people whose stories or dealing with post traumatic stress I deal with. Probably the most dramatic of the PTSD stories is that of an American doctor named Wilsey. Late in the book. I won't go into all the details, but because um, I have to leave something for your viewers to some reason for them to buy the book. Wilsey finds himself at Dachau, which is one of the death camps. And he and his American comrades are the soldiers, the Allied soldiers who liberate uh, Dachau, essentially arrive there and beat off the Germans who are defending it. Um, and then ultimately become involved in one of the most horrific experiences where they turn on the SS, the people who have actually been running the camps and their post-traumatic stress after having gone through the war as Americans to that point is manifest in an equally disastrous and horrific way uh, as the um, Gestapo and SS and run people who'd run the camps had inflicted on the Jews and others who had been imprisoned there. And that moment, uh, that balance of whose post-traumatic stress is right and whose post-traumatic stress is wrong hangs there and you get a strong sense of what happened in that moment. It's not a very well-known story. And I, and I spoke with uh, Dr. Wilsey's daughter who allowed me to use the details of that encounter. Um, and it's pretty horrific. Uh, Ted Barris, author of many, many books uh, commemorating and preserving the history of our involvement in uh, wars. Um, this has been absolutely wonderful. I appreciate it. It's a great public service. And as I said, uh, it's now our generation that has to keep these stories alive and you're doing a great job at it. Come back soon. With pleasure. Thank you.